Um, so we'll get started by um, having everyone introduce themselves. But first, I want to preface the panel. Um, so again, my name's Dawn. I'll be moderating this panel today. Um, I am no longer a young person, um, but I got my start in student activism um, at UC Davis in 2005 with the student PERGs. Um, I have the privilege over the last 15 years of working with young people across the country, um, and I'm uh, super excited. I'm very privileged to be joining, joined by Effie, Alex, and Christina, um, and Christina Williams today to talk about um, how young people across the country in colleges and universities have um, taken on the challenge of COVID-19 over the course of the last year, have maintained their organizations, continued to develop leaders and recruit and make a difference in their communities, um, and how that transition has gone back to in-person this year. Um, so excited to hear some of the lessons learned that they have, um, and then some of the advice that they have for folks listening in. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and let y'all introduce yourselves, um, and then I've got a ton of questions, and then any questions that audience members have can feel free to pop in here as well. Um, so while these folks are introducing yourselves, please put in the chat where you're um, tuning in from, um, and if you're affiliated with an organization or a school, feel free to pop in the chat where you're from as well. Um, so see, if, uh, we'll start over with you, Alex and then um, go over to the other panelists from there. But please put in the audience members where you're calling in from as well. Thank you so much, Don, for getting us started. I really appreciate it. Um, like Don mentioned, my name's Alex. Um, I am, my pronouns are he, him. I have that listed in my name right there. Um, but I'm a student at Piedmont Virginia Community College here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I've been a student organizer for a few semesters now, um, and it's fantastic work. It's incredible work. I love engaging with fellow students, and I love, um, I don't know, I love the work. It's great stuff. So yeah, Christina, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, hi, all. My name's Christina. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, like Dawn said, I'm in Florida. I'm at Eckerd College. I study um, American-focused gender studies and political science here. Um, I work with the student PERGs um, on campus. I'm the vice chair of our organization, as well as the coordinator for our New Voters Project. Um, I've worked with the student PERGs my entire time in college. Um, this is my second year uh, with them. I got started before I even got to campus and jumped right into leadership. Um, once I was on campus, which was awesome. Over the summer, I spent time working across the South, virtually, of course, um, on 26th Amendment um, anniversary work, since it was the 50th anniversary of the youth vote. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. I love working with students. Um, I'm a student myself, so I love talking to people, meeting new folks in the field, and being able to connect with everyone. Um, so I'll pass it off to Effie. Hello, I'm Effie. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm a first year student at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Um, I've been involved with the student PERGs uh, for about two years now. And I got involved in North Carolina back in my old school. And I'm pretty much working on starting a new chapter here at Georgia Tech. And I guess I'm excited to see what the future holds for us here in Atlanta. And I'll pass it off to Christina. Hey everyone, I hope you can hear me, but I'm Christina Williams and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a senior political science major at Clark County University, also in Atlanta, Georgia. And I got into student organizing just a little bit over a year ago um, in the summer of 2020. And I founded our civic engagement coalition at my campus called CAU. And I chaired that and, you know, graduating senior, we're really working on institutionalizing civic, engage, civic engagement on our campus since there was really no framework for that. Um, and that's the goal of my work right now. Great, so excited to be here with all of you. Um, so I think the first question from my end is um, just COVID, right? So this last year has been, um, I, I think, well, I will use all the cliche words, transformative, challenging, um, for everyone, especially college and university students, um, managing, having to pay for school, um, you know, affording basic needs all while everything was remote. Um, so 
how did you and leaders in your group manage COVID this last year? Um, and how, how were you thinking about the return to in-person? Um, and how has that played out? So I'll just open it to whoever wants to answer that. I can go ahead um, and start by answering this one. So for the student pergs on our campus, we were one of the only clubs that were super active um, and involved um, during the virtual time. Um, we were, I was fortunate enough to be able to come on campus fall of 2020 um, when that was my first semester in college. So I finished my senior year of high school and student pergs was this very amazing active organization in this virtual hybrid space, which is awesome. Uh, transitioning out of that, um, after incredible engagement with the student body in a remote setting, people are really excited to get back in person, um, I've realized, which is amazing, because who wouldn't be? And something that I've noticed is people are trying to balance everything, remembering how to socialize, how to be back in person, but also how to make in-person civic engagement. Um, I know on our campus, everyone is so excited to be back in person. We had 86 people at our kickoff for activism for the semester, which for context is about 5% of my campus. It's pretty small, um, which is an incredible turnout for a campus who's just back in person. That's pretty impressive. I know um, similarly, just in my life going back in person, I'm like, how do you human? How do I do that? <laughs> I, I can hop on and share my perspective to this question next. Um, so like Christina, I got my start uh, uh, with organizing early in the fall of 2020. And um, it was interesting. It was it was interesting work working from home, working digitally, working with people from other coalitions in different states and different backgrounds. Um, but it was great. It was great work and it was great um, experience to, to kind of get my foot in the door and learn how to uh, work with other organizations and, and do so in an unprecedented manner. Um, going back in person, though, like Don said, has been a challenge. Um, learning how to re-socialize, learning how to interact with people, learning how to uh, engage with other students. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm at a community college and community colleges are commuter campuses. So there's not really um, a, an institutionalized sense of community like there is at, an, it's, at a four-year institution. Um, and, and this year, uh, we were really worried that enrollment uh, would uh, take a dive because people have hectic schedules right now. People have work to keep up with. People have multiple jobs that, and they're trying to uh, stay afloat, frankly. Um, but we've been pleasantly surprised. We've done a ton of um, on-campus engagement with the students that are enrolled in, on campus. And it's been super, super nice to just be back face-to-face -face with other engaged individuals. And um, I don't know, I'm really thankful to, to be back in person after the unprecedented year. Um, like Christina and Alex said, it is a bit of a transition period coming back to in-person. I got involved with the student perks um, in another state at a community college uh, like two years ago. So pretty much like before I had like two semesters under my belt, we went like remote and I did do a bit of remote voter engagement work um, the summer of 2020 and pretty much just coming back in person to like an actual four year university, I guess that is a big transition. And I have been working on like recruiting people for our new chapter here. And I guess surprisingly, people are pretty eager to like get involved with us, especially our environmental campaign. I was very surprised that a lot of people were interested in that here. Um, but other than that, I guess I'm very pleasantly surprised that people are still willing to get involved with in-person events. People are pretty eager for in-person events after like semesters of being online. So I guess that's a bit of my perspective. 
is is COVID um, uh, still impacting your work? I know different schools have different protocols for masking, for vaccination. Um, it, are people hesitant to do in-person events? How is that playing out on your campuses? I've definitely seen a lot of traffic towards the remote option or the hybrid event planning option. Um, it's never a guarantee anymore that people are going to show up to an event, especially if it's hosted at a central campus or, or something. We recently had um, our statewide democracy summit and we hosted it here in Richmond, which is the capital of Virginia. And um, normally it's an in-person event. Uh, we would have hoped to have it all in person, but the bulk of the crowd was there digitally. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it definitely is affecting our work to an extent, but we've been able to adapt. We've been able to find new ways to engage with these people that might not necessarily feel safe uh, engaging in person. Um, I guess on my campus, things are pretty much returning to normal. So we do have most of our classes in person and I've been able to like recruit a lot of people making class um, presentations that way. But I guess people are too worried about COVID or in-person events, but like one-on-one -on -one meetings, like I guess interviews for like an internship position or like a leadership position, people are pretty willing to do that stuff um, online because I guess it doesn't make too much sense to like commute to a certain location when you could just do it online. Um, I guess, yeah, just smaller events online and I guess bigger and in, in-person events when we're actually trying to accomplish a specific goal um, for whatever campaign we're doing. Welcome back, Christina. We we're just chatting about how people are managing the remote slash in-person balance on campus. Um, and then Christina Reagan, I know Eckerd is a smaller college, so um, it's a little bit different. Um, how is how has that been on campus? Yeah, so Eckerd is super small, about 1,800 students for context, and we don't actually have a remote option anymore. Um, so everything is completely in-person. Um, and something that's been we've noticed is be within our bubble people are more likely to actually show up to in-person events versus um online events now so even if there is a digital option a big part of our campus culture is being connected to others and really engaging with each other in their in our community so it's a really great place to do activism work and social change because everyone really cares about each other in the community with that, we don't actually end up with a lot of people online, even if it is an option, because we really want to be in that space. So what we've been doing for all of our uh, events with the student perks is taking all of those COVID protocols. So all the events that we are doing are safe and people feel comfortable. Um, so we subscribe to that um, bottom line safety. All of our volunteers wear masks anytime they do anything in person, social distancing in keeping to those COVID protocols. So that all student and all of our volunteers are required to be vaccinated. Um, on campus, we've got about a 90% willing vaccination rate. Um, it's not mandated in Florida um, because of Florida laws. Um, part of that community that Ecker just kind of fosters. And so with that, all of our volunteers for student perks are vaccinated, they're masked, they're distanced. So we can really encourage people to show up, to come to our events and to have a great time and be engaged in activism because we know they, they're not as likely to come if it is a remote event, um, just on our campus specifically because of that sense of community. Um, speaking of folks showing up to things, um, how did y'all feel about recruitment and leadership development as you came back into the semester or quarter? Um, and what were you nervous about? And then how did that all play out? Um, I can hop on quickly. Uh, so at Piedmont, um, we were really worried about enrollment going into the semester and especially in-person enrollment. Uh, the bulk of our uh, 
uh, returning enrollment was actually either asynchronous or um, digital options. And um, we were scared. We were worried that uh, we weren't going to be able to engage as many, with as many people as we normally did. But um, we hired an intern that is taking primarily online classes, and she's been able to provide a ton of super helpful support to people that uh, aren't as aren't on, our, aren't on campus as often as somebody that's taking classes uh, completely in person. And it's been super helpful to have that perspective on our team. Um, somebody that works from home works, I know we all have that experience from the past year, but um, it's been really helpful, especially with a uh, smaller than average uh, class on person right now. I don't know, it's, it's been really helpful. Hey everyone, I can jump in here. Sorry about that. One of the major issues on my campus is the Wi-Fi. Um, but just some of the things that we've been working with on recruitment, um, I will say since we were an organization that started at a time while we were completely remote, um, I was nervous to see how people would engage with us since we were pretty much new on the scene and we hadn't done any in-person events. Um, the caveat to this is that my campus does have a vaccine mandate, um, so pretty much everyone is vaccinated or they received a valid excuse. Um, so people have been very eager to engage in person again, um, kind of the same as Christina's campus, just with a sense of community. Um, we are a smaller school, um, but we're also in a consortium of multiple schools, so it's kind of both. It's a good mix, but we've actually surprisingly had very good engagement, um, even with different uh, organizations I've led on campus before, you know, it's usually been a pretty steady amount, but it's been kind of like an explosion of engagement this semester. And I'm not sure if that is, you know, just excitement to be back outside or if people are really continuing the momentum and the motivation that we had from the previous election cycle, but I'm not questioning it too much. It's been great. So I guess, um, unlike everyone else, I go to a really big school. I think we have like 30,000, I have no idea, just a lot, a lot of people. And pretty much I'm new here. So basically did know the layout of things, how things worked, all of that. So that was one of my big, like my biggest concerns regarding recruitment. Um, I will say it's been a bumpy ride. Um, I've been trying to get... Um, this, our chapter of the student perks um, as like a registered student organization. So we have more resources to do stuff. And yeah, that was a very stressful process, especially since I kind of made a bit of a mistake in my paperwork, but hopefully we'll be becoming a registered student organization tomorrow. Hopefully fingers crossed. Um, and the recruitment, I we've managed to get like over a hundred um, interest cards, which is really great because it's basically been we don't have a lot of people yet. Um, so it's basically been a lot of work on me and my campus organizer. So that is going very well. Hopefully we'll start actually having to, well, so hopefully we'll start having actual events because I know like since it's just me and our campus organizer, we haven't been having a lot of events since we're mostly focusing on recruitment. And that's one of, I guess, one of my concerns that people are starting to lose interest because we're not having things immediately, but since we since we're like becoming like an actual student organization on campus with actual like bargaining power hopefully that will change in the future fingers crossed so it sounds like generally um people are gonna stoke to be back on campus and like ready to do stuff and there may be some you know it sounds like there's some competition like a lot other a lot other things happening and then some of the travel stuff is difficult especially for you alex overall um what happens when people come in the door like how's how are planning events going what are some sex successes that y'all have had this fall already in this transition i guess well we haven't started having events yet but I will say that um, a bit of success for holding events, I guess, just listen to feedback of what people want. Um, I know 
like the interest cards we passed out they had we had people like check the campaign they're interested in and I guess when we hold events for those campaigns people seem a lot more interested and when we actually take the time to contact them they seem a lot more interested yeah if I can add um We've had one in-person event so far for National Voter Registration Day. We did a tabling event. Um, it was very successful, surprisingly again. We registered 96 students, um, but I think something that really helped us be successful is that we used our coalition. Um, so in addition to just having our CAU Votes volunteers, we also partnered with our chapter of the NAACP um, and our pre-alumni council. And then we also partnered with off-campus partners like Civic Georgia, um, in Campus Vote Project. And so that was able to give us a lot of resources, a lot of volunteers. We were able to shift, have shifts and switch people out. Um, and then also we held our event outside um, in an area that had a lot of traffic. So I think that we're gonna try to stick with those components for the rest of our events this year. That's super awesome. I love hearing about like all y'all successes. Something that worked really well um, at Eckerd is we've got a three week long orientation for our first year students. So it's first year students and then um, all the student leaders on campus for three weeks. It feels like summer camp in a way, but it's they're taking a class and they're really getting adjusted to the community. So during this three weeks, um, Everyone was in person on campus. Um, it really was the first time it truly felt like a college experience, at least for me, as one of the student leaders that was there. And so one of the things we worked on was voter registration. Almost every single day, we were outside of the cafeteria. We were at um, the center area where all their classes get out um, in the academic quad. We were all across campus at events, um, at required uh, like seminars they had to go to everywhere. And we registered 25% of the largest first year class Eckerd has ever seen to vote. 25% of them. I still can't believe that number. Um, we trained about uh, 18 volunteers, new volunteers. There was originally three of us on campus for the, those three weeks. And we trained 18 new volunteers, registered 25% of these students. Um, all in three weeks. And I think that really shows the power of in-person organizing when people are super, super excited to get involved and start doing things again. Um, and I'm really proud of those numbers and I'm really proud of our campus and just kind of the energy that in-person organizing really brings back um, to the whole field. I can jump in really quickly, but everybody provided incredible insight that kind of overshadows our event plan planning here at Piedmont. Um, here in Virginia, we have an election every year. It can get annoying at times, but it's always uh, really fun to engage new voters around uh, the election process in Virginia. Um, so we've been set up three times a week in the student center registering voters uh, in person. And that's been my favorite part of uh, the engagement this year, really talking to students, answering questions that they have about the registration process and even the voting process if they want to vote earlier and or uh, absentee by mail. Um, it's been super great to get back face to face with people. Um, I really missed it. Um, and it's nice. We've also uh, um, hosted um, uh, Charlottesville is in the 57th district of the House of Delegates here in Virginia, but we've been hosting uh, delegate candidates on campus. And that's been really, really cool uh, for candidates for public office to come on campus and interact with students. Um, sometimes I feel like it can be a pretty uh, foreign, the, the idea of a politician can be pretty foreign to the average student. Uh, there's not much room for engagement between the two, but it's really nice that um, two candidates, Rob Bell and Sarah Ratcliffe, were able to come on campus and interact with us and stay around for about two hours or so. It, it was really nice. It was really helpful. That's awesome. Not overshadowed at all three times a week. That's that's awesome. Um, those are some really um, impressive stats coming into the year for sure after like a year and a half of being off. I know I was nervous about my ability to like chat with people in person and actually be effective for sure. Um, 
given that, um, it sounds like Alex, you already shared a little bit of um, some of the hybrid things that y'all have been doing. Um, but what are some of the biggest innovations that y'all took away from the year and a half of remote organizing that you're going to carry through to this current year or already carrying through? Yeah, for sure. Um, like you mentioned, in the hybrid space, I think we've all become Zoom or Google Meets or whatever your preferred uh, uh, programming is. I think we've all become experts in the meeting space. We've all learned how to frame our shots, although I think I'm out of frame right now a little bit. Um, uh, and so on the technical side of things, I think we've all become more tech savvy in the past year and a half. Um, but in the planning sense, the event planning sense, I think that uh, hybrid events have become a lot less like taboo and unnecessary and a lot more uh, accessible. I think it's become something that we'll, we will see in the future regardless of the event. The ability to attend something if you are out of state, the ability to attend something even if you're out of the coalition that is hosting the event. Um, is super, super helpful going forward. I, I think it's really, I was able to attend things that I could, probably never would have gone to in person uh, over the past year and a half because of the hybrid model. And so I, I really do think it's the future of event planning in general. Christina Raffi, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I don't know. Um, so one of the big things uh, that I've taken away is tracking um, in the virtual space. So one of the big things um, that I learned that they used to we used to do for in person organizing because I've never done any kind of in person organizing before this year was keeping interest cards and interested in getting involved, um, forms on paper, filling those out. And I'm like, what do I do with these pieces of paper now? Um, how do I like recycle these? And they're like, don't recycle them, keep them. I'm like, what do I do with all of this paper? So there's currently um, piles of like interest cards we got from this year um, in my room. And I kept thinking back to when we were phone banking online you can't exactly pass a piece of paper through the like screen on Zoom to call them, to interact with them. And one of the big things I've been really pushing uh, my chapter at Eckerd to do is use these in-person paper resources, get people to sign up, and then re-put them into the spreadsheets. Keep those online tactics. Um, tracking online, make sure that everything definitely stays together, that you're not losing anyone's cards or phone numbers or emails. Um, and it takes a little bit more time, um, but I am very picky about my spreadsheets now. <laughs> I very much love them. And keeping track of them this way, hey, this person really loves volunteering with us. They volunteered at all these events. Oh, look, here's their name on another spreadsheet we have. They also love doing this event. And it's been really helpful to keep track of volunteers and just stay engaged and make sure people don't get lost in the paperwork and fall behind my desk or my dresser, um, like some of my homework has this semester. So it's been really good of just tracking online and keeping some of those resources we used um, and keeping those in this in-person space. I am yeah, I did. Oh, to that too. sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Effie. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely resonate with the stacks of interest cards in the room. Um, I guess something that I learned is contacting people through multiple channels. Um, so I created a listserv of all the people that are interested in our organization, like an email listserv. And I created a group me and then I pretty much texted everyone, like three modes of communication, I guess. And I guess that really hammers the point home that you want people to get involved with them because sometimes people slip through the, clap, the cracks. Sometimes you can't like read people's number because they have ugly handwriting on the interest card. Um, no offense. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just multiple channels of communication, like always have like a backup plan. If you can't reach someone through text, uh, contact them through GroupMe. If you can't reach someone through GroupMe, email them. I guess just keep going at it so no one falls through the cracks. 
some good lessons. The virtual space thing really resonates with me, Alex. I've been able to just sort of pop into other states' meetings um, and meet coalition partners and students um, a lot more. I feel like we did more conference calls before COVID and now everything is Zoom. And, and even though it makes you tired, it's like so much more personal um, than being on a conference call. Or maybe it's just me, I have, I have a problem focusing. You know, the, the video is really helpful for me. <laughs> if folks have questions uh, for our panelists, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, one question that I've got for y'all is, um, you know, there are people tuning in who are um, nonprofit practitioners, they uh, work with consultants, they work with tech companies, um, and y'all are um, comparatively, I think, getting started in your activism work. Um, so, you know, how can nonprofits, how can the folks listening in who are not students um, support your work? And what um, have folks done in the past that have been helpful for you developing um, into an activist? One big thing um, I definitely know is uh, fund young people. Um, money is the way to get anything done. Uh, and that's how you we can best support uh, student activists is through funding and making sure that young people are supported and engaged through this measure um, because that's how we get trainings. That's how we learn how to do things. And that's how we can fund young people, just fund young people. We can do amazing work. If these are the numbers that we're getting without getting a lot of funding, imagine what we can do if we have money and resources to do it. We're the next generation. We are the largest and most diverse generation ever. The, the work that we can get done with just a little bit more money, with a lot bit more money, is incredible. So that's my biggest thing, is fund young people. We're doing amazing things. <laughs> we could use the support. Christina going for the jugular. jugular. Give me your money. <laughs> I guess something I would say is just shoot your shot, even if you think it's not going to work. Because because this past couple of weeks, I was searching for an advisor so who can become an actual organization. And I like know zero teachers, zero people at this school. And I was pleasantly surprised when I got a yes back from a professor I had never met and didn't even know me. So I guess don't be afraid to cold contact people um if they say no that's fine but the chance of them saying no and the chance of you doing what you actually want to do like I guess just weigh those I guess the worst people can do is say no so don't be afraid uh I can't say enough about Christina's statement uh it rings true uh and very much so. Uh, we will return your investment uh, uh, tenfold. We are, we are here uh, and we are ready to work. Um, but another thing I think to build on that is maybe investing and looking into uh, unconventional institutions. And when I say unconventional, I mean institutions like my institution, like a community college or uh, smaller universities uh, that maybe don't have the same uh, uh, weight behind them that a, a four-year institution does. I know that uh, it would be incredibly helpful for me uh, and uh, to have the resources uh, comparable to a normal institution because I'm going to move on to a normal institution. I'm sure Effie can speak to this a lot coming from a community college. It would probably be incredibly helpful to have resources that would prepare her for her time uh, right now. I know she's bogged down starting a new coalition, which is incredibly, incredibly important work. But if she had that formative uh, experience at her community college, I think that it would only make her work uh, more successful. So like Christina said, invest in us, but invest in us everywhere. <laughs> invest in us from uh, every uh, place that you can. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a struggle. Um, in, especially in places when there's there's not elections every year, although that can be tiring. Um, I spent a lot of time in New Jersey, so definitely feel that struggle, Alex. <laughs> um, I, I have a question for y'all around um, 
you know, what motivates you. It's been a, a tough year and a half. It continues to be tough, I think, for um, a lot of folks. There are a lot of things you could be spending your time doing that is not registering voters and working on climate campaigns and talking to strangers about politics, um, two things that I'm sure your mother's told you not to do, certainly mine did. <laughs> don't talk to strangers, don't talk about politics, don't talk about money. Um, it's it's a difficult thing, especially as a young person um, heading into this work. So what keeps you motivated um, on a day-to-day -day and you know what what kept you going in the toughest times in the last year? I could say something that motivates me is seeing uh, just how uh, driven and just how uh, uh, how much confidence my fellow uh, organizers and my fellow advocates have. Um, I'm an anxious person. I'm an anxious wreck. I'm not going to be the first person to speak in a room. But being surrounded by people like that has boosted my confidence tenfold. Uh, so, um, yeah. Definitely what Alex said, being surrounded by people that are driven for a certain goal definitely is what motivates me. Seeing people like so passionate about something they care about is definitely, definitely something that gets me through tough times. And basically also me thinking that if I don't do this, who else is going to do it? Um, I guess just even though it's uncomfortable right now, it's not going to be uncomfortable later and just believe in the process. It'll work out eventually. One of my friends put this kind of the best way. Um, the way like, I get, I'm an extrovert. I love talking to people. It's kind of my jam. Um, I am the first person to talk in a room likely. I make friends in the middle seats of airplanes. Like I'm one of those people. Um, and so the, my friend put it a really good way. I really like experiencing people. And so not only is it the, like you both said that passion being surrounded by folks, um, the energy of being surrounded by folks with that passion, not only is it inspiring then, but that one person that maybe the only conversation you have with them is voter registration. And you're able to tell them like, hey, this might be a local election. You're voting for one person in two amendments. <laughs> like, This is what you're doing. And then that matters and that your voice matters. It might feel really small, but it's not. And being able to see people inspired by that and experience kind of this one small interaction you have with them like experiencing people that way is really what keeps me going. Um, seeing someone totally transformed by like registering to vote. That was me just a few years ago. Um, like I went to one weird meeting for the Audubon Society about renewable energy in the back of a brewery when I was 17 years old. And it was that one person who was like, hey, by the way, this 17-year-old high schooler who's never looked at a petition before, you have a voice and it matters. And that's kind of what's kept me going through all of this is seeing that in other people. Um, because I know it was that one thing that inspired me to do the work that I do now. And the little main character part of my brain thinks that I'll inspire one day someone to do the same thing. And it's that chain reaction. Um, that really keeps me going through just experiencing people. That's such a good transition into my next question. <laughs> um, for, for anyone who's listening in that is getting started um, in organizing on campus um, or organizing young people or just, you know, organizing their first time overall, um, what's a piece of advice that each of y'all have for folks who are getting started um, in this work moving forward? I said it before, but just shoot your shot. The worst they can do is say no. Just do it. Just do it. I wish I had you over my shoulder, like before my first door that I knocked on, you know, when I was <laughs> thinking about that. Just like, Effie going, just do it. <laughs> I 
it's okay to have questions, I think would be my big one. Like it's okay to not know. Um, you do not have to know what you're doing to start. Um, you do not have to know everything when you finish either. <laughs> you just have to be okay with asking questions and being able to be like, hey, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. Um, I think is the really big thing that I have to keep reminding myself that it's okay that I'm not sure and that I don't know. And it is okay that I am wrong as long as I go back and fix it. Um, I think is a really big one I have to keep telling myself. I couldn't agree more with both points so far, but um, from the student organizing perspective, I, I guess I have two things. One would be connect with faculty, connect with uh, professors, connect with administrators, connect with whoever you can connect with and market yourself to them. Um, I've gotten a ton of no's. I've gotten a ton of, we don't have enough money for that. I've gotten a ton of denials, but through that, I've also shown that I care. I've shown that I want to have, I want to plan these events. I want to do these things. And if I annoy these people enough, maybe someday, someday I will get a yes. And this is me being a, a, a bit comedic, but we have a ton of support at Piedmont. Um, Connie Jorgensen, who's our civic engagement coordinator, provides more than enough support uh, for us. But um, marketing myself to our president is something that is incredibly helpful for uh, personal projects and projects for our coalition. Um, so yeah, stand up for yourself, speak up for yourself, like Christina did earlier when she yelled at you all to invest in us. I love it. Um, I love Connie, such a good resource. Um, so great to have her in the fight for sure. Um, so we've talked a, a lot about reflecting on what y'all have done so far. Um, I want to give y'all an opportunity to share what work you have upcoming. Um, what what campaigns are you excited about? What events are you excited about? Um, you know, inspire us with the work you've got planned. I have a bit of a silly one that I'm really excited about. Um, one of our volunteers is working on um, an absentee event. And so this is partnering with our tea club on campus. And so it's absentee, spilling the tea on absentee ballots. <laughs> and so in Florida and in St. Petersburg, so in Spain, Petersburg specifically, we don't have in-person early voting. So the way that you can vote early is through requesting absentee ballots. Um, so we want to make sure this option is known for students um, if that's where they wanted to vote. And so this big event is partnering with our tea club on campus and we're in the process of working it out of spilling the tea on absentee voting. So it's a very silly one, but I'm really looking forward to this. I've heard a lot of vote puns in the last 15 years. And man, that is like top three of the list. That's really good. I can't take credit for this one. I can't take credit for this one. This was for um, another uh, new voters project organizer. Love it. Alex Raffi. I don't want to bog the, uh, the mood down a bit, but we've been doing a lot of event planning, uh, we, we have a one book on campus, which is a, a book that is uh, chosen at the beginning of the semester and everybody on campus has access to it. Um, this year's being uh, the, misinformation, the misinformation age, how false beliefs spread. So it's a pretty dystopian, it's a pretty dark subject uh, that we are all living through, unfortunately, but we've been doing a ton of super cool events uh, surrounding the one book. Last week we had Professor uh, Vijanathan from the University of Virginia who also wrote a crazy successful book that I am blanking on the title of right now, but um, his perspective was incredibly valuable. It was the day after the Facebook whistleblower spoke on 60 Minutes, so it was a very uh, timely subject to talk about, but um, it's been really cool to have uh, obviously, we're doing our engagement work. Obviously, we're yelling at people to register as often as we can. 
but it's been really interesting to have events uh, surrounding uh, issues like that that are central to engagement efforts, just not maybe directly. Uh, yeah, really important work. Um, I'm excited for you you to share that with me personally, um, so we can pass it on. <laughs> Effie, one of event that um, you're excited about or campaign you're excited about? I guess not an event, I guess, more like a process of actually becoming a real student organization. So we're not poaching tables in the library next to people that are screaming at each other. So we don't have to pay like $100 to rent a room for an hour. So I'm looking forward to having an actual meeting in a room. Totally feel that, have done that scrappy organizing, being like, can I share half of your table, please? <laughs> Love it. All right, we've got a question from um, Allison. Um, a lot of their org's digital outreach um, relies on peer-to-peer -peer texting and Facebook groups. Um, as Gen Zers, um, what digital communication methods do you feel like are most authentic um, and are best at relationship building? So I have Facebook. I have not opened it in like three months. So not Facebook. Um, I would say peer-to-peer -peer texting, it does work. I would say if you like, make sure you in include your name and your organization in the text. They don't block you. But if you put your name and the organization you're with and how you got their number, I think they might, they, they do remember if they're interested in your organization. And also I would say, don't sleep on Instagram direct messaging. I did that a lot last summer. Um, it works, it works. Um, and Snapchat, I don't know how Snapchat works, but if you can direct message people on there too, they would probably answer. But don't call people. Don't call people. They'll block your number or something. Yeah, people don't like getting calls from numbers they don't know. I definitely think that we should collectively agree that young people don't use Facebook. The only time that I use Facebook is when my mom tags me in things. Um, but I do think that um, texting peers, messaging on Instagram, um, and I also think calling your friends. I know my friends pick up when I call them because I never call them outside of like an emergency or voting. So they're like, it's one of the two. <laughs> and so they'll pick up for me. And it's a really great way to kind of start that conversation. Um, and I think the digital communication Right now, transitioning back in person, I think people really value face-to-face -face conversations more than they ever have, especially ones where they feel comfortable not knowing how to human. Um, like Don said earlier, remembering how to human um, is really important. And I think people might get really nervous um, through like a phone call now um, or even just a text message like, how do I engage in making people feel comfortable in even digital communication as well as in-person communication is so important. So I think that if you're calling or texting someone, and this applies to this in-person organizing, anything can be authentic when you make sure that everyone involved feels comfortable. Um, so prefacing like, hey, how are you? Making sure that you lead that conversation because the empathy that and the confidence that you go in with that conversation the person's going to reflect that at least 50%. <laughs> at least that's kind of my own, how I've realized. So if you call someone, if you text someone and you're like, hi, I'm really excited to talk to you about this. Here, have a picture of my dog. Or, oh my gosh, look at my new cat that I got. Like, if you're really excited and you're personal with them too, they're going to also remember how to human, regardless if it's digital or if it's that in-person conversations, if that makes sense. Do you want to add anything to that, Alex? Yeah, I can definitely say that something more personable, like peer-to-peer -peer texting or even a phone call, um, is definitely something that I would uh, um, uh, lean towards. Um, I don't even have Facebook anymore. I got rid of my Facebook uh, for a number of reasons, privacy concerns being the most uh, pre prevalent one. Um, I'm not sure what the scale of your organization is, Allison. Um, but 
what I hear on campus a lot from Connie Jorgensen, who's my civic uh, uh, coordinator, civic engagement coordinator, is why don't we start a Twitter page? Why don't we start an Instagram page? Like, why don't we, why don't we get out there? But you really aren't going to get much traction unless you are a pretty substantial organization. And I'm sorry to like put it blunt, but uh, me and a lot of people my age use social media for uh, personal um, and recreational use. And I don't see a lot of people primarily using social media uh, as a marketing tool. Uh, now, there are people like Christina, who's on the call, who definitely do that. And uh, and I don't want to discount that in this, but um, I don't know, something more personable like peer-to-peer -peer texting, I think is something that would, um, that I would be more likely to engage with. I'm sorry if that was just like anecdotal experience, but. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in a little bit on this one. We've done a ton of this nationally. Um, we're running a huge COVID vaccine education campaign in a lot of our states, um, texting all of our old lists. And I'll, I'll say it takes a lot of work, but we, don't like the texting programs um, because they're so impersonal. All of the sort of automatic responses lack the sort of things that any of us would do in normal texting. Our response rates are 10 to 30% if it's just from somebody's phone and you can put an emoji or a GIF or three exclamation points. Um, and, you know, our sample texts have things like, I'm a real human, I just want you to vote in parentheses. Um, and people literally respond to that and go, oh, I thought you were a bot. Um, because like, I think, especially from this last election, I am not a young person. Um, I'm a solid middle millennial, uh, but a lot of folks targeting still have my name on their list. Um, and so, you know, I. I can recognize what is a standard text message versus a text message from a local group. Like my local NAACP chapters text messages are really different than some of the statewide mass texts that I get. Um, and so we actually just do the physical thumbs or, you know, uh, if you've got an Apple device, you can do it um, with, your, with your Mac. Um, so we just do that across the country. And then we do it from local communities too. So if you can say, um, I'm from Florida Perg students, in Jacksonville, the response rates are way better. And if you can have the person on the other end texting from that community and say, yeah, the Civic Center is where the vaccination site is. I was just there yesterday. That's just so much better than saying, here's a random website where you can look up a location. Um, that's been really helpful for us. And then engaging in local groups, I definitely agree. IGDMs have them been the best way to build coalitions. Because like a lot of student groups have emails, but nobody responds to them. <laughs> um, and people and young people aren't really on Twitter. I think it's all for reporters and political wonks, as far as I can tell. Just me and Christina <laughs> um, tweeting articles that we like. <laughs> um, so you know, IG DMs have been really, really helpful. Real humans can send gifts. I know for <laughs> the 2020 election when we were texting people for voter registration. Because how do you unsubscribe from an automated text? No. In really big capital letters. So I just had an inbox, like a text inbox full of no. Um, just like being yelled at me. And there was a gift that I found that's like, I'm a human. Um, that I would just send to people after I got those. And it had good responses. People were really excited about that. Um, so just being, being a person, you're a human being. So are they. Great. All right, well, we've got five minutes left. I wanna give y'all some time to share how everybody listening can follow you and follow your work. Um, so this is time for your, whatever handles you wanna share, websites, um, how people can give you money. So um, I, I don't know if we can chat with y'all, um, but you, you'll if y'all could just spell out where people can follow you. Um, and it's also on our Netroots page. So all of our Twitter handles are there, but um, Anything else that y'all want to share on how to follow your work? Uh, okay, I'll go. I'll go. Um, my Twitter is at feo2oj. I don't really use Twitter as Don said. It's for people that get into fights about politics. But yeah, 
and and posting articles that you like. Um, yeah. I have a PayPal too, if y'all are interested. fbo 2 jagoon at gmail.com. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I share a lot of the work that we're doing as well as really cool articles um, that our work is either in or other students. My Twitter handle is C underscore P underscore Reagan, um, R-E-A-G-A-N. I'm also on my network site. Um, so feel free to follow all that on Twitter. I'm pretty active on it. Um, and I'd love for you guys to kind of like just share the work you're doing as well. That would be awesome. Um, I'd love to see what you guys are all working on and what you're taking away from this panel. Just kind of see where you guys go from there. Get to experience y'all as humans. I guess last but not least, um, I do not use my Twitter as a marketing tool. It's like you all, I share what I'm frustrated with. I share interesting articles. So if you're ever interested in my perspective, feel free to hop on. It's linked in my um, uh, uh, Netroots um, account. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Support non-conventional institutions and support HBCUs, support community colleges support these things because they have incredible, incredible organization efforts. And however they can be supported uh, will only make those uh, those advocacy efforts even more relevant. Love it. Um, and you can follow me at Dan like Dawn, Dan like D-A-W-N on Twitter. Um, and then student perks, we're just at studentpergs.org. Um, that's where you can give Christina money. Not directly, but you can give Effie money directly through PayPal. Um, all right. It was so great and to see y'all. Thank you for sharing your Twitter handles. Um, definitely tag us. Tell us tell us what you thought. Tell us your takeaways. Um, so inspired by um, all of you on this panel. Um, every time I, I talk to y'all and all of our prep, I go, wow, man, what was I doing in college? This is so great. Um, so excited to see all of the work that y'all are able to accomplish in this next year um, and down the line. Um, I certainly am coming out of this um, feeling more um, jazz to do work and get back into the fight. And thank you for everyone for tuning in.